Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I have Dr. Heidi Brocky joining me. I'm actually in Tacoma, Washington right now doing readings at Crescent Moon Gifts. I do readings here every Tuesday. So this is going to be fun for me to have an interview here in the store. First time for me. So let's see how it goes. We're doing a great topic today, toxic relationships. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Heidi. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. So let me go through her bio super quick. As a toxic relationship awareness and healing specialist, Dr. Heidi Brocky has turned her past into her passion as she provides hope, healing, and freedom to those whose lives have been affected by toxic relationships, emotional abuse, and narcissistic behaviors. After 24 years in healthcare, she has now moved on to use her life experience and her education to be the person she needed when she herself was trapped in the darkness of an unhealthy relationship. Through education, Dr. Heidi presents to her clients the understanding they need to empower themselves to walk through fear and into freedom. She has been featured in Forbes, Time Magazine, and Thrive Global for the dedication given to her clients and her work in the toxic relationship area. Her podcast, It's Not Normal, It's Toxic, has reached clients and followers worldwide, now with over 1 million downloads. She plans to continue her mission to educate as many as she can on the effects of toxic relationships and emotional abuse. Dr. Heidi, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you're here. This is such an important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you hear those bios and you sound like you're so important and you think who wrote that? Because it sounds like, and then you think about it. You're like, oh, I did do all that. <laughs> I've heard that bio for, for a long time, actually. Well, great. I'm glad I could read it back to you. So this is super important. I found you several years when I myself was coming out of a toxic relationship. So I want to dive right in and let's start with your story. Cause I always like to ask what has been your journey to this moment doing this work? Um, well, for the listeners that can relate to me already, when someone asks you to tell you their story, I have to be like, okay, well, well you better grab a couple of whiskeys and like an ottoman and a blanket um, because there's <laughs> there's so much stuff that leads up to this and it's, it, you got to pick and choose what to put in and what to leave out. But um, the first thing that I will tell you, which comes to a, uh, as a surprise to a lot of people is because my name is Dr. Heidi and I'm working in this realm um, people are surprised to find out that I'm not a licensed mental health professional. Um, I am a chiropractor acupuncturist by trade. Uh, so that makes people even wonder more, why is she doing this? I usually, I usually start my story by saying I grew up in a little tiny uh, farming community right outside of Bozeman, Montana. And a very close in the community, we all went to the same church. We all went to the same school. I saw the same people for the first 18 years of my life. And when you grow up in a community like that, you, you're pretty sheltered. And when I left to go to grad school, I think I had in my head that everyone was like the people in the community. Okay. That being said, now knowing what I know, when I look back into the community, that perception was also incorrect because there was... There's a lot of stuff that goes on everywhere, right? Um, but but that being said, I really thought everybody wanted what was best for everybody. And there was good in everybody. And everybody should work together and everybody should be accepting. And that's kind of this little fluffy cloud I floated out to grad school on. Um, it was in grad school that I met my former husband. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into this because this is where the blanket and um, pillow come in. I was hesitant to go out on the first date. And I only I only say that because that was the point that I should have known to listen to my intuition or listen to my gut, right? There was something that made me uneasy. Um, I probably didn't pinpoint the uneasy part because I wasn't very in tune with my feelings when I was that young. But um, after being asked out seven or eight times, I have the personality that doesn't want to be the bad person. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to. And so I started feeling guilty. And so, okay, fine, we'll go out. And then there was a second date, which was the same thing. And again, very long story, very short. Then I was pregnant, decided to get married because that's what, that's what you do. Or, or back then, that's what you did. Uh, called off the wedding, uh, ended up having to marry him because of threats, married him. 
pregnant again, owned a business together, had a ranch together. And all of a sudden it felt like the blink of an eye. Everything was just like this, the money, our life. Um, and the whole time thinking, I feel like I am very uncomfortable in this relationship. Like, I don't, I don't feel like this relationship is flowing like it should. It seems like it's a lot of work and I just cannot put my finger on exactly what it is. Um, I was also under the, under the umbrella of, I was raised uh, with a Christian faith background. And so I had that, that I put a lot of thought into. I had taken marriage vows. I am pretty serious about promises that I make. I had two daughters that I was raising in that. And you go off of things that your parents and grandparents said, things like relationships are work, right? And so we keep, we keep trudging. And, and my thought was, well, you know, I keep hearing that I, I need to change this or I need to change that and I need to do better and I need to try harder. And if I wouldn't do this and things would be better. And I am that type of person. I will accommodate to other people because if if I wasn't if I wasn't a person with an emotionally driven personality, I certainly wouldn't be in healthcare, and I one hundred percent wouldn't be doing the job that I'm doing. Um, things remained the same. I slowly was very isolated from my family. Um, I worked very hard. We were we were always together, the four of us. Um, I ended up giving up hobbies. I ended up giving up a lot of things, but in doing so, I completely lost myself. I'm a very charismatic, loud, outgoing, energetic person. And as this relationship progressed, um, I hardly talked. I didn't laugh. I didn't smile. And I know by the time that I, I left, I was literally looking at the ground all the time. Um, a lot of, a lot of untruths, a lot of broken promises, a lot of lies, that kind of thing. But it seemed way too hard for me to step out of it because everything that had happened that I seemed was a lot of work tended to be blamed on me. So if I was going to make a change, like the relationship, that's going to be blamed on me too. And then I failed and I gave up and I let people down and all of that. Well, um, things escalate as, as we know, they always do in um, unhealthy relationships. And I finally was able to file for divorce which was a another struggle. Uh, if I wanted divorced, we were not using attorneys and he was writing the divorce papers and I wanted out so bad, fine, we'll do that. He put every loophole in the divorce papers that he could. Um, again, uh, not knowing what I know now, signed him. Uh, would not split the business, would not let any separation at all. And two years later, nothing had changed except the fact that I had divorce papers in my hand. And so sometimes I talk on my podcast about the day I ran away, but what a lot of people don't know is the day I ran away from him, I had already been divorced for two years oh. and, and I ended up signing him. I basically signed him over everything. And I initially, I initially left my kids, um, because the divorce paper said 50, 50, I thought that that would work out and he kept them from me for five years. So I relocated, started over. Um, started chiropractic over. And then I really started needing something. We were just talking about that. When you kind of get remotivated, you, you know, you get excited about something. I started doing uh, women's retreats on making yourself a priority. And I didn't talk about it when I was in it because nobody understood me. When I moved, I didn't talk about it again, because how do you explain that you're a mom that left two teenage girls four hours away? Um, and I, all of a sudden at these retreats started talking about my past. And I remember thinking, oh, don't talk about that because people are going to judge you and people, you know, nobody wants to talk about abuse. And at that point, I'm not even certain that I had really registered the fact that it was an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but all of a sudden I started talking about it and realizing these people that were coming to me for priority were coming out of relationships just like this. And that's kind of what started me thinking along the lines of, of helping people. And that was seven years ago. And, and now I am doing it. 100% full time all day long, every day and completely retired from healthcare, which makes me sad because um, when I was in it, I really literally thought I was the only person that had a relationship like this because everybody else seems so happy. I must be the one that messed everything up. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's sad to me that there's that many people out there that don't have the education and the knowledge of what's actually going on in these types of relationships. Right. 
And because I really don't think we were taught, you know, we're taught an abusive relationship looks like this. And it's the one model where it's physical, right? But nobody was talking about the emotional abuse or the verbal abuse. You know, we might have heard, okay, name calling is not okay or something like that. But the other thing, the manipulation and the very subtle, you know, abuse kind of gets swept under the rug. It's ignored. It's blown off. And, you know, it's we're taught not to pay attention to those things. Or right. when we think that something's a little off, we're like, huh, that's a little off. But we're stuck in the spiral of trying to figure out why it's off until years later when it starts to escalate. Yep. Yep, for sure. Um, and a little bit about, about the word toxic. Um, Please. I, cho- I chose the word toxic seven years ago before it was all over social media. And the reason I chose it is toxic is not a diagnosis. When you see it, how it's how it's presented now on on social media, it sounds like this is a toxic person, and he is they are fully encased in a toxic shell, and and toxic is actually an adjective, and it's it's used to describe any relationship in the status that that you're in that may be unhealthy for you mentally, physically, or emotionally. Mm-hmm. The thing people does the thing that people don't realize is we are the ones that get to decide who is toxic for us and who is not because someone who is toxic for me may not be toxic for you. It's, it's a personality mismatch, but from the toxic person's view, it's a personality match. Um, It's two, it's two people that are in a relationship with separate goals, but because we have this idea of how the marriage is supposed to work and we believe that our relationship goals are the same. We keep trying and trying and trying to make to make the relationship better. And when the goals are different, you know, trying to work as a team, if your goals are different, doesn't work very well. Right. There's also a personality that you talk about that attracts toxic relationships. Let's talk about that a little bit. That people pleaser, the accommodator, that nice person. Yes. And and I will say, because you said people pleaser, people pleaser over the years has gotten a bad connotation. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Oh, they're a people pleaser. Okay, in in my opinion, that is that is a good thing to be. It doesn't mean that you're a doormat, which is also a word that I hardly ever use. It means that you have a personality that is kind and caring and loving and giving, and co- you want to avoid conflict. You want to keep the peace. We are the ones that are going to put everybody else before for us because that is how an emotionally wired person is fulfilled in life. That is what drives us is taking care of and supporting and fixing. And the toxic personality in general, okay, just the toxic personality in general, which can be anything from the bully on the playground all the way up to the things you're seeing on Netflix. The toxic personality is is driven by the same thing. And the things that they need, our personality supplies. So when when I hear my clients go, I don't know, but this is my third one and my picker is broken. No, your, your picker is not actually broken because your personality is a target. And so when I work with private clients, um, we do a lot of self-discovery stuff because on top of all of the education, I need to make sure that these people understand they they have to be a lot more picky on who they share their good personality with. And sometimes after you've been through the mill, you you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. After you've been through the mill, you trying to get find your identity back and trying to figure out who you are after you have literally changed everything about you to try and make them happy that it's a difficult journey. And I've been out for 15 years and I, I still work through stuff like all the time. And you know what I say that, but everybody in life has to work through stuff. But I think I get frustrated because I, I feel like, Oh my gosh, I should be able to fix this. I should be able to fix this. And I think I'm I'm really starting to realize that there's some things that just aren't going to be fixed and, and I'm going to have to figure out a way to handle them when they present themselves, because if I can't fix it and it shows up, I immediately beat myself up. You're such a failure. You ruin everything, you know, and I spiral back right down into that hole of all those words that I heard for so many years. Mm-hmm. There's also a process afterwards where like when you enter the dating scene and not only from myself, but from my girlfriends as well, you expect certain things. And then you're either, you know, not surprised when they happen or when it doesn't happen, your nervous system goes, oh, well, it didn't happen this time. And then that person gets to teach you that there's different in the world. And Mm -hmm. I've heard, oh, my picker's broken. I've kind of said it myself and I have girlfriends who have said it. 
And it's coming back to, let's talk about, you know, when we ignore or minimize or excuse behavior, because I think that's part of it too, is like, we don't want to see these behaviors. We want to see the potential. Right. 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 Um, Being in a toxic relationship, and you've probably heard me say this, is a lot like walking into a room that stinks. If you stay in the room, the smell goes away. Okay. It's not because the room doesn't stink. It's because your body desensitizes you to the smell. Once, once you get used to the smell, it doesn't seem like it's so bad until you walk back out into fresh air. And then we go, oh, that room really stunk. The toxic relationship, the control and the power that is put on us by the toxic personality is a very slow drip. And, you know, in my story, I didn't want to go on a first date, but then here I was walking down the relationship road and this happened, this happened, this happened. It was all very slow drip. And all of a sudden I felt like I was completely 100% trapped with no choice but to stay there. And in going through that, you would, you never really feel like you're trapped until all of a sudden you're trapped. And, and that's, that kind of goes back to the emotional abuse because you just talked about the dating. Um, What emotional abuse is, is when somebody uses your emotions to get what they need. Okay. The toxic personality um, in, in, again, in general, which is another hiccup for us emotionally wired people. Uh, the toxic personality in general usually has a insecurity in themselves. Okay. Um, I could never have brought that up. That would have been a fight if I would have tried to discuss the insecurity, right? But they have an insecurity in themselves and they place people in their life that, su- that can supply them with the things they need to feel secure. So if you found yourself or you're listening and you're in a relationship that's unhealthy for you, you are supplying them with something that they need to feel secure. Okay. Um, Going through those relationships, the minute you try to change something or you try to leave or you try to change the dynamic or you try to break up um, or you try to cut contact, excuse me, that, that instills that insecurity in them. And so they hang on tighter. That's when abuse, abuse escalates. That when, that's when things get a little bit more out of hand because they're feeling insecure and they want to regain that feeling you know, of, of control. Um, so we talk about stepping out into the dating. Okay, you, you have compromised so much of yourself that we basically give up our identity to that person so we can avoid conflict. And the toxic personality really wants us to become emotionally dependent on them through the emotionally abusive tactics that they use. So that was just a whole bunch of words that all the listeners are going, okay, I have no idea what she just said. But what emotional abuse is, is when somebody uses your emotions to get what they need, meaning if they can say or do something to get an emotional reaction. So if they can say or do something that makes you happy, that makes you sad, that makes you upset, that makes you feel guilty, that makes you angry, that makes you frustrated or makes you feel feel fear. If if they can say or do something that causes you to have a feeling, they know that they can control how you feel by what they do and what they say. And, And that's called emotional dependence. That's how they know that if we try to change the dynamic, all they have to do is say something that makes us feel guilty right? We don't like to feel guilty. And what's the first, the fastest way to get rid of the feeling of guilt? Do what they want, Mm -hmm. right? That is an emotionally abusive person using guilt by something they say or do to get you to come back, get to you to do whatever they want so that they feel in control, which makes them feel secure. So when, when I get a private client or on my podcast, or if people, you know, have ever worked with me, the number one thing that we do is we go through the situations in their life from the perspective of the toxic person. Because you and I, we talked about we're emotionally wired. We only see the world through emotionally wired eyes. Mm -hmm. So, so, and think about how many times in your former relationship, you looked at your partner and thought, how come you can't just act normal? Right? We think that all the time. How come you can't just be nice? The reason we look at them and say, how come you can't just act normal is because we only see this particular situation through emotionally wired eyes. And we think if we just tell them how we feel and we just tell them what we need and we just tell them how they hurt our feelings, that some morning they're going to wake up and they're going to act like us. They're not acting normal to us because they're not emotionally wired. We would never use the manipulative tactics and the name calling and the criticisms and all that to get what we need from somebody else. 
So to us, they're not acting normal, but to their personality, they're acting 100% normal. And so in order for us to understand the situation for what it really is, since we can only see the world through emotionally wired eyes, I teach my clients how to see every single situation through the eyes of the toxic person. And as soon as you can see it through their, what motivates their behavior, it really makes you go, you've got to be kidding me. This is so easy. And in doing that, making sure that, that people understand that, then moving forward into new relationships and new friendships and new work situations, you're able to spot those because now you know how that personality thinks. You no longer have to look at every situation through the emotionally wired eyes. Now, the only other thing that I say, and I, of course, I'm, I just coach in this, so I don't tell people what to do. I just support them in their choices. Um, I had no idea who I was anymore when I left my former, and I'm, you can probably completely relate. Uh, three weeks after I got married, he was so upset with himself because he always told himself he was going to marry a blonde. Okay. For the people that can see me, Clearly, I, I'm not that, right? So through the 12-year marriage, it was co continually putting more highlights in my hair. If this will make him happy, put more highlights in my hair. Wear these kind of clothes. Don't have these friends. Just, you know. And, and the day I'll never forget, um, I looked in the mirror and I did not even recognize who I was. What we do is we take on our identity with the people who are around us. Because... We don't control our own emotions anymore. So we have to look to other people to tell us how, we how we're how we supposed to feel by the way they treat us or what they say to us. If your spouse is in the room, you're a spouse. If your kids are in the room, you're a mom. If your mom's in the room, you're a daughter. If your friends are in the room, you're a friend. So, yes. so we step out of these relationships and we sit in the room by ourselves and, and we have no idea who we are because our attention and our energy for the time we were in those relationships is 100% focused on keeping them happy, hoping you're good enough, being accepted. So you sit in a room and think, okay, now I can do my own hobbies or what makes me happy? We can't even answer, we can't even answer those questions because we don't have an identity if somebody's not telling us what hat to wear. So I do a lot of self-discovery and I encourage a lot of self-discovery because you honestly, you don't wanna step back into a relationship where you're looking at somebody else to tell you how to feel. Now, right. I've been I've been remarried for 11 years in September to I say the perfect man. He gets irritated when I say that because that that makes him feel like he has to be perfect just like I did. But um uh <clears throat> excuse me. When we, when I stepped into this relationship, I didn't know what I knew now. So if he would come home from work quiet because of something that happened at work, I immediately thought he was mad. I immediately thought it was something I did. I immediately, because I was so used to waiting to see how I felt according to how somebody else treated me mm -hmm. because I had become so emotionally dependent. Now, for the people who are listening that that think, oh, well, I, I can't really relate to that. Think about this. And I'm going to just use the um, intimate relationship as an example. Sure. Uh, it, it's Thursday morning. You're um, in the kitchen. The kids are running around. It's the same schedule and you hear them get up and they're talking to the kids and the kids are laughing and you hear him pet the dog and he comes in the kitchen and grabs his coffee and pats you on the back and gives you a kiss and tells you to have a good day at work. What kind of day do you have that day? Great day. A great day. Friday morning, same thing. Same thing happens, but you hear him coming down the hall and you can tell he's heavier and he hollers at the kids. He kicks the dog. He grabs his coffee, walks out, doesn't say anything and slams the door. What kind of day do you have that day? That day. That is someone who has become emotionally dependent on how their spouse treats them before they decide how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And this, this, after being out for 15 years, this has been my number one hardest thing to overcome. To remind myself that my, I get to have my own feelings and not everything is my fault when somebody's having a bad day. It's not my job to fix everybody's things. Right. Um, so, so I do a lot of self-discovery. We give up our value system. We accept things we would never accept. We put up with things we would never put up with. And then we, we quit setting boundaries because they walk over them. And then who looks like the lady who can't set boundaries? Right. Okay. We, we quit setting them because we're trying to avoid conflict. And so if you jump into a new relationship before you do that 
self-discovery work, it's all normal to you. So you're immediately going to rely on them to tell you how to feel. You're going to immediately rely on them on how you wear your hair and what they like. And, and you were all of a sudden, right off the bat, going to be trying to do everything that they want. So that we're just good enough because the toxic person programs us to act and do the th things that they need from us to get what they need. And if we don't unprogram that, we just, we just walk right into another one. Mm -hmm. I like what you said earlier, you know, where you came out of it and you didn't know who you were. I think a lot of women experience this when you're asked the question, what do you like? What brings you joy? And then you stop to think about it. You're like, huh, I don't know. And that process of self-discovery is really important after experiencing a toxic relationship for sure. And I think, I think, you know, what, what is really difficult for people leaving, and I'm sure you had this too, from the very beginning, they start instilling self-doubt in us. Um, and it's and again, it's a slow trickle. And in the beginning, we like to wear our hair the way they say that they like it, right? And so we think, oh, well, they like us so much and they like me with my hair up. I'll just wear my hair up all the time because this is a new relationship and that's what they like. And then one day you go to the beauty shop. I have said this on my podcast and you go to get your hair trimmed and it's spring spring and you've been wearing the same ugly messy bun for eight months so you think oh, you know what I'm just going to get it all hacked off and you get this cute style and you go home and they say you know I only like you with long hair mm -hmm. okay the next time you go to the beauty shop you don't say how does Heidi want to wear her hair you go how do I think he wants me to wear my hair and and we start making decisions based on what they want to avoid conflict because they know if we can't make small decisions without being with it, so we're avoiding criticism, we are never going to make a big decision that will change the dynamic of the relationship. And I remember when I got out, I had to start a new business. There's a lot of decision making going on. And I had to learn that you just have to make a decision. The toxic personality really leads you to believe that if you make the wrong decision, a firing squad is going to show up. Mm -hmm. So, so we learn if we just don't, if we don't make a decision, the decision will be made for us somehow. You know, everybody can relate to this. Where do you want to go to eat? What's our standard answer? I don't care. Because, because in the beginning you probably did care, but it got criticized and they didn't want Mexican. And how come you always want that? And that's so gross that eventually to avoid conflict and avoid criticism, we just say, we don't care. So when somebody asks you, what's your favorite food? You don't even know. I had a client once, she was 53 years old and I asked her what her favorite color was. And she had no idea. Now that, that ended up being a situation where it was a parent who picked all her bedroom colors, picked her prom dress colors, picked her wedding colors, decorated her house. She had no idea. But, but there's been times when I've asked clients, what's your favorite color? And the answer I get is, I don't know. He always wanted me to wear blue. That yeah. is obvious identity, toxic identity theft. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that word before. Toxic identity uh, theft. Yeah, actually, I am a very termy person. And since I'm not a mental health care provider, mm -hmm. I don't want to use, I don't want to use the therapy terms because, right. um, so I make up my own. So that's one of my, I like it. I like that one. I also like, um, in one of the recent podcasts that I listened to, um, you were talking about how you end up living their life and not your own. Oh, exactly. So then when you're kicked out, well, not kicked out, they're never going to let you go. But um, when when you remove yourself, you you don't even know how to live your own life. Decision-making is awful. Um, meeting new people is awful. And even though that was that, that whole recovering from that was the hardest thing I ever did. I thought living in it and, and escaping from it was hard until I started having to rediscover myself. It's fun, but it's hard because you have to push yourself to do it. So let's talk about going into that recovery process. What is it that you work with your clients with on like, okay, let's dive into you and discover what drives you, what brings you joy. Let's talk about what you bring your clients. Okay. So the first, the first exercise that I have people do, and I'll give enough information that you guys can do it is I have them take two pieces of paper and they write the alphabet on each piece of paper. And on one, they write something they want more of in their life that starts with each letter. 
And on the other one, they write something that they want less of in their life that starts with each letter. Okay, one of those lists is always harder to fill out. Can you guess which one? Mm, what you like. What it's you so much want. easier to well, write down what you don't want. Well, nobody's asked them in 20 years what they want more of in their life. What, what city would you like to go to if we go on a vacation? I have no idea. And so I, I have them do this because what we focus on is what we attract, right? So when we have our attention on pleasing the toxic person and keeping the toxic person happy, our attention is on, I hope we don't fight. I hope he doesn't criticize me. I hope we get along. I hope. So you're thinking continually about everything that's on that list because when you're in it and tell me, tell me if you can relate to this, when you're in it, you don't have time to think of, I wonder why he said that, or I wonder why he did that because all you can really pay attention to is what he said and what he did, because you have to learn how to respond really quick. So you keep yourself safe and you avoid conflict. So we're continually looking, how, how's he, how did he shut the door when he came home? How heavy is he walking? What did he say? What tone did he use? What? So we're continually trying to stay one step ahead. That's called survival. mode. And when we're doing that, yeah. yep. All we think about is all the stuff we don't want in our life because we're trying to protect ourselves from all the stuff we don't want in our life. So, if you so might manage it, then it won't come. The hope right. is that it's not going to happen if you do this, this, and this. If they come home and they say, well, um, it really doesn't feel clean unless the toys are picked up. So then the next time they show up, the toys are picked up. Or I'm okay. really hungry when I walk through the door. So you make sure every night when they walk through the door, dinner's ready and on the table. Yep. Yep. And the, if we go back to the emotional, the emotionally wild personality, if if we talked to a hundred emotionally wired people. 99 of them would say that their feet were on fire before they hit the floor in the morning, right? We got to do this. We got to get kids here. We got to do this. There's this, there's this written list of unwritten expectations that, you know, if you don't have done, you're going to get criticized. Mm -hmm. We we never get up and go, oh, I'm so glad I have an 8.30 a.m. pedicure schedule. We go, oh, I guess I'm going to have to move the pedicure that I've been waiting eight months for because somebody needs me. We get up in the morning and we make sure everybody in our world is going to be okay today. Mm -hmm. And the toxic personality gets up and says, how am I going to feel secure today? And what person is in my life that can give me what I need? Wow. Yeah. Let's dive into that because you said that you teach your clients how to see through their eyes. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. Well, if, if we know that the drive of the toxic personality is insecurity in themselves, right? Okay. Here's where the problem comes in with us being emotionally wired they all have a reason that they're insecure. Your, your toxic personality or your narcissistic personality or your bipolar personality, any, any, even of the mental health diagnosis, they didn't ask to be like this, right? There's something that caused them to be like this that was out of their control. So, so when, when we hear that, oh, they're insecure and we figure out why they might be insecure, it could be a traumatic upbringing. It could be a diagnosis. It could be, you know, um, an addiction. But what do you and I do when we hear that somebody has had a traumatic upbringing? Mm. Sympathetic, empathetic. We feel know. sorry for them. Yeah, we feel sorry and, for and them. We, we go back to the, I can fix, I can support. I'm going to prove to you that you can be loved. And because that's what we feed off of. Yeah. So that's why they pick us as a personality because we are going to feed right, right into that. So if you think about what they need, their goal, overall goal is to feel secure in themselves. And we actually like the same thing. When we feel out of balance and we feel insecure, we really want to feel secure again too. So mm -hmm. I can't blame them for wanting to feel secure, right? Right. Okay. You and I know that what makes us feel secure in ourselves is the things we put into our own life. You know, it's when you have a good group of friends, your career is doing well, you love your apartment, you can keep it clean, you're working out, you're eating healthy, you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you need an example of that, we all step on the scale on January 2. And how do we feel about ourselves? <laughs> that damn seven pounds that we weren't going to gain showed up, right? And we feel like we look bad and we feel like our clothes don't fit. And we think other people think we look bad. And, and we feel very insecure in how we feel, how we look. We're disappointed that we let it happen. But we take two weeks, we clean up our eating, we walk every day, we lose seven pounds. And how do you feel? Great. Because you have invested in, yep. 
<laughs> yes, you invest in yourself and, and you're proud of that. That's what makes us feel secure. Okay. Mm -hmm. The toxic personality cannot do that. They cannot put enough into their own life to feel secure. So they put people in their life and they put people in their life for th things like attention. And it could be positive or negative. They like attention when they're being nice and you're loving. They like attention when you're crying and you're, and they've been criticizing you. They, they like to feel in control. They like the feeling of power. They like admiration. And those are the, those are the types of things that the emotionally wired personality is going to try to accommodate for them. And because the emotional personality wants to be good enough and wants to be accepted and wants to be loved, we are willing to change who we are to become what they need. Mm -hmm. Even if it's dye your hair blonde. Wow. So we take, we take certain instances back to my clients. I don't know why this happened. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this happened. I am so good at predicting the toxic person's behavior because I've seen so much of it that I can listen to 20 minutes and of somebody telling me what's going on in their relationship. And I can, I have an explanation for every single thing. So I teach them that perspective. Okay. They said this and they did this, but they're looking to feel secure. So if they're criticizing, they feel power. That's bully on the playground. If I can make you feel bad, I feel better. And where is our attention when somebody's criticizing us? On them, right? And so I teach them how to take everything that the toxic, that the toxic personality has put into this cycle and see it from that perspective. Because once you know that that's, that's why they're saying and doing, it makes their criticisms a lot less harsh. It makes you being scared of them less, you know, then we, but then we bring up the, okay, good. I, I, I can't do this one more day. Now that I understand this, right. I also have to be, have everybody prepared for what's going to happen when you try to change the dynamic, because if you sit down and say, okay, this, this marriage isn't working for me anymore. I want a divorce. They're immediately going to feel insecure. Yeah. Okay. And the only way they can feel secure is to regain that feeling of control and power and attention. And I can almost write a list of, so that people know what to expect. You're going to, if you're going to expect this, they're going to say this, they're probably going to do this. They're going to try this, but don't forget. It's just because they're feeling insecure in themselves they're so that you can take that, you know, that panic, <gasps> you can take that down a few notches. Now, the other thing that I teach people in recovery is we had that feeling in our stomach very early on. I had it before I ever said, yes, I'll go out. Okay. What we don't realize is we don't realize that that feeling is your body's natural, de de natural defense mechanism telling you something's wrong, mm -hmm. but you and I go, Oh, we just had a bad day or, Oh, you know, it'll be okay. Or, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. So we kind of shut that feeling down thinking, I don't know why he's making me nervous because he just had a bad day. Right. Well, as you stay in that relationship, like, you know, cause yours was extensive, uh, you get used to living with that feeling. So when you remove yourself from that situation, you need to know that that is your body telling you something's wrong. So moving into new dating and moving into different places in your life, really start paying attention to how your body feels. You know, that's where this, the only confusing part of that is that's where triggers come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. What a trigger is, is your body recognizing something that resembled something when you were in an unhealthy place. Right. And the triggers come through our senses. It's something you see, something you smell, something you taste, something you hear, a feeling. And, and your body doesn't know for sure if that trigger is that person that is dangerous for you or, or if it's somebody else that just happened to say the same thing. The example right. I like, the example I like to use is um, you're in the grocery store and all of a sudden you have that feeling in your stomach and all you're doing is buying groceries. Okay. And you have that overwhelming feeling and you feel like you have to leave the store because your heart's racing and you can't get enough oxygen. And then you realize that the person that just walked past you in the aisle is wearing the same cologne that your former used to wear. Okay. Your body sent you into what felt like somewhat of a slight panic attack. Your body doesn't know that that's not your former. All it knows is the last time I smelled this, you were in an unsafe place. Yeah. So yeah. we do a lot of working through triggers and 
And I just, just really honestly, to be, to be 100% transparent um, in the last month, I have had a couple struggles with triggers and this far out, it makes me so angry. Mm. And, and I did just make the realization, some of this stuff is not going to be fixed. So instead of beating myself up for not being able to fix stuff, I, I just come up with a plan when this happens. Now we just follow the plan. Right. Because yeah, you otherwise you can work yeah. with the trigger, you know, where it's coming from yep. easing your nervous system and then yep. just allowing it to relax yep. and revisit it when you're not in the trigger state. Yep. And sometimes, yeah. you know, it's not a trigger. You're on a date and you're feeling those same feelings. And we try to go, Oh, it's just a trigger. No, it's not. This is another toxic person. So okay. that's the confusing <laughs> part. Like, what is this? You know? And, but if you start getting really used to staying in tune with your body and your body starts knowing you're keeping it safe, this is where my chiropractic philosophy comes in. Your body knows it's keeping that you're keeping it safe. You're going to be able to rely a lot more on how you feel. And, and you're also going to, going to not feel so bad taking yourself out of certain relationships. I, um, after I, after I figured all this out, I was really like, oh, wow. Well, okay. If my personality attracts this type of person, I started doing an in inventory of the people that were difficult to work with, the friendships that felt like they were a lot of work. And, and sure enough, those, the ones that I felt uneasy about had, had also targeted me so that they could get what they needed. And, and I, at this point will proudly say, I do not have a problem staying away from somebody now whose energy does not match mine. Mm -hmm. it's a, if I never see you, again, so what? And I never think about it because I really want to save this for the people in my life who deserve it. And you also need to know we are emotionally wired, which means we need emotional reciprocation. Yeah. You know, and we don't want to waste all our emotional energy on people that are going to suck the life off of, out of us. We want to, we want to be able to, to have that emotion and those feelings reciprocated, you know, the acceptance and the deserving of love and the being able to be yourself and, and show your own personality. Right. Somebody's going to show up and respond in a healthy way instead of a reaction. Yeah. Yes. Or and, projection. And, and, and then that's tricky too, because somebody shows up in a healthy way and we think they're love bombing us. They're faking <laughs> us. They're <laughs> us to say, you know. And so, that's so real. <laughs> so it's very, it's very difficult, which again, makes us come down on ourselves because we're, we're big self blamers. Yeah, we're um, basically retraining ourselves to see things for what they are and not for what they were. Yep. Yep. And so so that's basically the, what I walk my my clients through. And we we have to 100% remember, this is nothing that is wrong with us. This is something that happened to us. We, over time, were programmed to give a certain personality what they needed. So when you look at the mountain that you have to climb to get back to find yourself, don't, don't let it be such a mountain. It's literally just reprogramming. Your attention has been on that. We just have to reprogram for your attention to be on you. You tried to take care of yourself. They told you you were selfish. So you quit taking care of yourself, right? And so it's just, it's just a reprogramming. Let's start getting your attention back on you. So that A to Z list we were talking about earlier, I have some people that have four words for each letter on the list of what they don't want. And they have three words total on the list of what they want. Right. But but it's a very logical exercise because you're emotional. You look at it and you can immediately see where your attention's going. Okay. Then we identify what's bringing into our life the things that we don't want. So we can work on figuring out how to either remove those people or the things that are causing that or figure out how to navigate it so their behaviors no longer affect us. So then we can spend the time thinking about the list of what we want more of in our life. Because honestly, when I was in that relationship, I really felt like I was put on this planet to keep this man happy, which never worked. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time I thought, okay, good. I did exactly what he wanted. He changed the rules and moved the goalpost and was on to something next. Right. You know, so I would just jump on the treadmill. And, and my realization was there's a lot of good people in this world. And I love having people around me. I'm very social, but at the end of the day, this is my life. I only, I'm only, I only get to be here once. So, so I really want to use my energy for the things I want to use it for, not because they need it. 
you know, and that being said, I kind of mentioned this before the toxic person isn't a bad person. So when I'm go, they feel bad and we have bad feelings towards them because of the behaviors. But what I try to portray to people is it's, it is just a personality that didn't act asked to be like this. And they're going to continue to be who they are. We have, we always have these small glimmers of hope. Maybe they'll change. I prayed that they'll change. I wish that they'll change. Accept them for who they are, not who you want them to be, because you asking them to change is no different than me dyeing my hair blonde. If that's who they are, accept it, let them move on and, and do them somewhere else so you can recreate the life that you were supposed to be in. And never, okay. ever, never, ever regret what you went through. We can always say, oh, I would have never married him. If Yes, I would have. I would have gone back and I would have done it the same because I have beautiful daughters and I have a great career. This is the best job ever. So when people go, what would you change? Nothing, because I had to learn every single one of these lessons or I'd still be struggling somewhere. Right. You know? And you're a stronger, more empowered woman now because of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's a lot of learning in that relationship to stand on your own feet, to have a voice, to know who you are. And you know, to trust who you are. Yeah, to trust. Because sometimes when you're going through the recovery, you really think you found who you are. And then you get a sense that somebody doesn't like that. And then you're like, oh, you know, and you really have to keep digging. Who am I? And and every layer you peel off, you're, you've just got to do it again. You know, but every layer you peel, peel off is another lesson. And I, I get so frustrated when I'm like, oh, it's another lesson. But then once I've learned it, I'm like, oh, I have to be grateful that I just went through that. It was mm -hmm. crappy, but now I, I get it. Right. I think one of the biggest lessons like you've talked about in your podcast is boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, reinstilling those boundaries and that self-love piece where what would I do if in this situation, if I loved myself or what would I tell my sister to do in this situation? I should be telling myself to do in this situation too. You know, yeah. that self-love piece. Yeah. And, you know, self-love is tricky because your friends always, all your friends and your mom and all these people, you just need to love yourself more. Okay. That does not come with a handbook. Mm -mm, no. Right. So then you're like, yeah, I need to know, I need to love myself more. I don't even know what that means. So, so we do, you know, we do an awful lot of work on that too, because we don't even know what it looks like to love ourselves. Does that mean go get a pedicure? I don't know. And, and the self-acceptance thing that, that is very up and down for people that have come out of toxic relationships. You know, you'll be doing really good for six months and then all of a sudden something will happen and you'll go down that you don't like yourself because you can't do this right. And you can't do that. And then there you are climbing back, climbing back out of that hole. So the, the recovery it's, it's an, an unending recovery, but, but don't let that get you down because I think everybody in their life is, is learning and is trying to be a better them. Yes. So, everybody's got something to work on and it's, there's no end date. Like it's a continual thing through our whole life. Yep. Frustrating at points for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that you would like to share with the audience that we haven't touched on yet? Um, yes, I, I think, I think what, what I would like to share with people is, you know, when I was in it, um, I left six times. So, so it was the seventh time I left that I was finally able to stay out. Um, that was, always, I was always coerced back with some type of emotional abuse. You know, um, I can't believe you're breaking up the family would make me feel guilty or he would just exhaust me until I was like, fine, okay, I'll go back. But I think, you know, my parents wanted me to leave. My friends wanted me to leave. You know, they don't always understand it. So they say things like, well, if it's so bad, why don't you leave? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh yeah, that's a great suggestion. Cause I haven't thought about that. Oh, except every day for the last 15 years. Because they don't understand that that bond that emotional abuse puts in, um, and I think I think one of the most relieving things that I really support my clients in is you are not going to leave until you are ready to leave, no matter how many people tell you. And and that's okay. And when when she read in my um, bio that I the reason I'm doing this business is so I can be the person that I needed when I was going through it, because I had no one in my life 
that understood what it was like to be stuck in an emotionally abusive relationship. And when I can be there for somebody, when even though their support system loves them, the support system just, just doesn't know how to support them, you know, and then we feel frustrated because they don't understand. And learning how to know when you're ready to go is, is a huge thing. And the education on seeing it from their perspective is what's going to give you that. Because I have six examples of me not being ready to leave, not understanding the situation, thinking I could do it and failing. Because when I have a client, a lot of people come to me without a goal. They mm -hmm. think they're in something. They don't know what it is. They have nobody that understands, but they heard a podcast and they felt like maybe I would. And I always, I always tell them, let's take the decision of whether you're going to stay or go and let's put it on a shelf. Let's not worry about that because if that was an easy decision, you would have made it 15 years ago because the whole relationship isn't bad. They're nice some days, they're mean some days, but mm -hmm. the days they're nice and the days they're mean are still for the same goal of them feeling secure, mm -hmm. you know? And, and when, when somebody leaves that I've worked with, I want to know that they have the education that they need so that the, when it's time to make the decision, they know that they are making the best decision for themselves. And with, with not a lot of, of em, a support on emotional abuse, um, that's the, that's the thing that you listeners that are in this type of situation need to know. Don't feel pressure and don't feel ashamed if, if you've left and gone back, or if you haven't had the courage to leave, because that means you're not ready. Nothing leaves your life until you've learned what it came to teach you. There will be a time when you're ready to learn. And when you're ready to learn, there'll be a time that you'll be fully equipped to make that decision. That's awesome, Dr. Heidi. Thank you for sharing that. Do you have any offers coming up in the future that we should know about? And how can people reach you? Um, okay, I do have something. Because, you know, when I was in that relationship, I wasn't Googling toxic relationship. I was Googling how to be a better wife, you know, how to be a better spouse. How come my relationship doesn't feel good? Why is my relationship so hard? Because I didn't know what a toxic relationship was. Okay. Right. On my website, which is coaching with Dr. Heidi.com, there is something called the toxicity profile analysis. And it is 106 questions. I'm going to warn you right now. It's long. Um, I use it, say you would go on and take it, you would get a score of mild, moderately, or severely affected by the toxic traits of others. The mm -hmm. score, the results I get are different. Each one of those questions correlates to one of the 21 character traits that I teach. So before you and I ever talked on the phone, I would already know exactly what type of personality you're dealing with. You never have to talk to me on the phone, but that's what I use for kind of a pre-session information. Um, but sometimes when you're really questioning your relationship, just reading those questions may make you start thinking because a lot of the things that you're dealing with are so normal to you, you wouldn't even know that they're abnormal. And so sometimes just reading through the questions and taking it will make you start realizing, oh, not everybody goes through this. This isn't normal. And, and sometimes that will perpetuate a little bit more research. Um, so, so that's coaching with Dr. Heidi. That's where my services are found. Uh, I, I do have a support group on Facebook. It's private. It is almost 6,000 people that you do not have to explain yourself to because they know exactly what you're talking about. They've all been through some type of relationship like this. And then the other thing, which this is the first time I'm even announcing it. Um, I had no idea that I would be 100% full-time all the time doing this. And so I've had to change my business up a little bit, bit to make my information a little more available. So at the end of February, I'm starting an online community, which is going to be very affordable, unlike the private coaching or, you know, your private therapy sessions, very affordable, where you can still get the information that I talked about that I, that I teach. Um, I'm not sure the link is quite ready, but it will be ready sometime within this week, which is February 6th week. No, oh, and that's fine too. Whenever you get that link ready, I can put it down in the show notes for people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That's great, Heidi. And I like how you pointed that out, like go through the list, even if you're questioning, because I think a lot of times it can be an eyes wide shut situation. I know for me, I didn't realize until years. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the other things, because I just talk and I'll just keep talking. So when you're done, just hit stop. Um, <laughs> You know, because when we start seeking validation, 
well, maybe they have a diagnosis or maybe they have this and we're Googling stuff and we're reading. And um, you have to remember that it doesn't, it doesn't make that relationship any healthier if they have an addiction, if they have a diagnosis or if they've had a traumatic upbringing. So when people go, well, I think I'm married to somebody who's bipolar or I'm married to an alcoholic or you validating that there might be something with their personality is good. But then us feeling sorry for them and trying to help them doesn't make an excuse for them not taking responsibility for their own behavior. Right. So it's good to it's good to read about the different personalities and those different things. But remember that it's 100 percent your choice to decide who is healthy for you or not, regardless of what they have going on in their life. Awesome. Dr. Hyde, I'm so glad you brought that back around to that first statement. Like it's up to you to decide what is healthy for you because not yeah. everybody is healthy for you. Yeah. And is there, sure. a jewel, yeah, is there a jewel of wisdom that you can leave us with today? To close you know what? The jewel, but the jewel of wisdom, I said it actually earlier. It is the quote that made the biggest impact on me um, after I left is um, I called my dad very upset. My daughters, because they were raised in it and they were with out their mom, like, like I was perfect. They're, 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 should they're difficult because they were without me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but because they were raised in that environment, they learned to survive. And initially they adopted some of those traits. And I called my dad and I was just beside myself because here I have these two beautiful girls. I finally got them back. And now I'm jumping through hoops to keep them happy and accommodate to them just like I was doing with him because that's that's what they learn to do to get what they need, right? And my dad said this. He said, Heidi, inner peace is accepting people for who they are, not who you want them to be. Oh. And it made a complete difference in the view that I took with my daughters as, you know, they're adults now. And, and they have definite residual triggers and stuff just like me from growing up in that environment. For sure. That's awesome. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Heidi. It was awesome having you as a guest. Thank you You're so welcome. much. This is such an important topic, you know, and it's being talked about more. And I really appreciate your time here and sharing with our audience all of your wisdom and everything that you've been doing over the last years to help other women, you know, through the experience that you experience for yourself. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thanks. That was fun. It was fun. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us again. I'm Liz Peterson, and this is raise the vibe with Liz. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at raise the vibe with Liz. And my website is Liz's healing touch.com. Go ahead and search out Dr. Heidi and see if she can give you a hand and take her quiz and check out everything she has on Facebook and her new group coming out. I'll have that link down in the show notes. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Heidi and everybody get out there and raise the vibe. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.